Hey, thank you for joining us at Revolution Church, where we are starting a revolution of grace in one life at a time. Hey, if you ever have any questions, would like to support this ministry financially, or you just want to learn a little bit more about us, you can head over to our website at revyourlife.com. And be sure to give us a follow on Facebook and Instagram. And you know, we would love for you to stay connected throughout your week, wherever you may go, with our Rev app. That's free and available for you to download wherever you might download your apps. And we hope that you enjoy today's message. All right. Hey, stay on your feet for a second. If you're here for the very first time, welcome to Revolution Church. My name's Zach. I'm the pastor. We are pumped you're here. Let's show them we mean it, church family. We also want to welcome everybody watching online, especially our service men and women stationed all over the globe. Thank you for all you do for us. Let's give it up for them. Make some noise for them. And then last, but not least, our God Behind Bars guys in the prison. We love you guys. Thanks for being a part of our family. Remember that we're one church, many locations and services, a church with a mission. Would you say it with me? Our mission is starting a revolution of grace in one life at a time. All right, grab your notes, and we're going to dive in to the third week of something that we have called His Name. And I heard a story about a little boy that goes well with today's sermon. There's a little boy named Johnny. And Johnny decided he wanted a bicycle more than anything for Christmas, so he went to his mom. He said, Mom, I want a bicycle. It'd be so cool to have a bicycle. I've never had a bicycle. And the problem was Johnny had been horrible that year. And, and so his mom kind of saw this as an opportunity to maybe teach Johnny something. So she said, Johnny, you know that we don't have a lot of money. I'm not sure if we can get a bicycle, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to write a letter to Jesus. And he's like, it's Christmas. Don't you mean Santa? And she said, no, Jesus. Write a letter to Jesus. Pray to Jesus about the bicycle. And he's like, okay. So he goes up to his room, gets some paper out. He starts writing. He writes, dear Jesus. I've been really good this year. Can I have a bicycle? Your friend, Johnny. And then he thinks as he's putting it in the envelope, oh, Jesus isn't stupid. He's going to know that this is baloney. I haven't been good this year at all. So he crumbles up the paper, throws it away, starts writing another letter. He's, Dear Jesus, I've been okay this year. <laughs> is that fair, Jesus? I've been okay this year. Can I have a bicycle? Your friend, Johnny. And I don't know when he starts putting in the envelope. It just feels hopeless. He's like, this is pointless. He wads it up. He throws it away. He, and Johnny's just beside himself. He just goes outside. He's crying. He's running. And, you know, he's kind of in a little tizzy. And when he stops, he looks up and he's right there in front of a Catholic church. And he thinks, oh my gosh, this means something. So he goes in the Catholic church and he kneels down, but he's only there like 60 seconds. And he hops up and he runs out. And as he's running out, he grabs a little statue of Mary and he steals it. He just shoves it in his jacket, takes it home with him. When he gets home, he shoves the Mary statue under the bed and he starts writing Jesus another letter. He writes, Dear Jesus, I've been terrible this year. I'm just being honest. I broke all 10 commandments, like most of them at least, not the murder one, but most of them, okay? And like I've been horrible to my mom and I broke my sister's Barbie doll and I shot spit wads at the teacher. And Jesus, I am desperate. I have your mother. If you ever want to see her again... Give me a bicycle. <laughs> Signed, you know who, right? <laughs> Clearly, Johnny believes some stuff about God, and unfortunately, I think he believes some of the stuff about God we believe about God that's not who God really is. And, and if you believe some of this stuff about God, I want to help you today as we look at this third name. All December, we're studying this one scripture from the prophet Isaiah. This scripture is written 700 years before Jesus is born. Look at it with me. It's Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Notice the words child and son, okay, like Ricky Bobby, little six pounds, seven ounce, baby Jesus. Notice that. Child and son. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called. Will you say the names with me? Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. Now, today we're going to look at everlasting father. And in the original language, everlasting father is this Hebrew word, aviad. Would you say it with me? Aviad. And it simply means father of eternity. But here's the interesting thing about this name of Jesus in the Bible. And Jesus has lots of nicknames in the Bible. Guy's got more nicknames than anybody, right? Jesus, this idea of him being everlasting father, it's the most mysterious name for Jesus in all of the scriptures. We just don't know that much about it because this word aviad, it's not used very much in the scriptures. But I think there's a few places we can go. And we can start to kind of form a picture of why he's everlasting father. Now, I, I told you, look at the words child and son. Think about that. Right out of the get-go, Isaiah is kind of confusing, isn't he? He says, you're gonna have, this child's going to come, this son's going to come. Oh, one of his names, everlasting father. 
Aren't you confused, Isaiah? Don't you mean everlasting child, everlasting son? Which is it? Is he a child or a son or a father? Like, make your mind up. There's a lot of mystery with this name. And A.W. Tozer said that the most important thing about us is what we believe about God. So I want to talk about some of the things we believe about God today. You might jot this down. I'm not going to read it. I'll just kind of tell you the story. John chapter 8. You might want to look at it later. It's a fascinating passage of Scripture. Jesus is in, in one of his, like, spiritual boxing matches with the Pharisees. Those are the guys that were super religious, that were always, you know, seeking to destroy his ministry. They were his religious antagonists. And in this particular story, Jesus calls God his father. And the Pharisees say, well, Abraham's our father. And Jesus is basically like, well, if Abraham's your father, do what Abraham said to do, because you ain't doing that. Then they, they just go low. They go for the low blow. They basically um, accuse Jesus of being born of sexual sin. They're basically saying Mary was sexually active before marriage, and that's how Jesus got there. So then Jesus, he says, listen, if you were really all about God the Father, you would love me because I am from him. And you're talking about Father Abraham, and I'm here to tell you I am who I am before Abraham was ever even in the picture. And they're like, oh, because Jesus is basically saying he is God, that he is everlasting, that he was and is and is to come. He is Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, right? This made them so furious that they actually picked up rocks and they they began to throw them at Jesus. This is one of the few places in Scripture where he has to, like, run and hide. He has to make an escape, all because of his claim that he was God. And he claimed it by claiming he was eternal. Now, ever since then, a lot of people have been coming against that claim. There's always been people that have said, like, he can't be eternal. And I, I would just tell you, he has to be eternal if he's God. You, you can't have one without the other. It's got to be both. And listen, if Jesus is not God, then you might as well pack your bags and go home because this whole Christianity thing is bunk if Jesus was not God. It's so important that we have this right theologically in our hearts and our minds. Isaiah was clear when he said this Messiah is going to come. He will be the physical embodiment of the everlasting Father. And then the ability for Christ to be this timeless source of, of fatherly love and protection and provision, it's reiterated to us all throughout the New Testament. Listen, here's just a few places. Hebrews 13 says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, claiming that he is unchanging and eternal. It says in Revelation 1, he is Alpha and Omega, symbolizing he's always been here and always will be here. Matthew 18, Jesus himself says that his divine judgment would be eternal, forever and ever. And in John chapter 1, you see John the Baptist, who was born before Jesus. He's older than Jesus. He's baptizing people, preaching about Jesus. And Jesus shows up to get baptized. And John basically says, oh, look, it's Jesus. He's the one that comes after me, but also was here before me. And they're going, what? He's speaking to how Jesus is eternal. So everlasting father, I want to talk about the significance of of this mysterious name for you and I as Christ followers today. Let, let's break it down, both words, everlasting. Everybody say everlasting. It's a word we don't use a lot unless you're buying batteries, right? Like we don't talk about everlasting, but he is our everlasting father. Now think about our earthly fathers. At some point, every earthly father has to leave. Every earthly father is mortal. At some point, he will not be here anymore, but God is our everlasting Father, Jesus, everlasting Father. This is what makes the incarnation, which is just the big Bible word to describe God leaving the throne room, coming to us as a baby in that manger, right? This is what makes the incarnation such an amazing thing. He came and invaded the earth to save us from sin and self. He came, he invaded our world. Why? So we could have an everlasting relationship with him that would affect our here and our now, but also affect our forever. Here's a few more scriptures. Deuteronomy 33, he provides the strength of everlasting arms, it says. 2 Thessalonians 2, he is our everlasting consolation. In 1 Timothy 6, he's our everlasting power. In 2 Peter 2, he's our everlasting kingdom. In John 14, he gives us life that is everlasting. In Matthew 28, he has an eternal, everlasting presence. And in Matthew 6, verse 33, he points out that those who understand eternal values are the ones who really understand what matters most. We can't ignore this, that he's everlasting, that he's timeless, right? 
We have to understand that as Christ followers. He's worthy of our unending, everlasting devotion, our, our most careful attention. Why? Because he invaded time. He invaded our world. He invaded our hearts, right? To save us from sin and ourselves. So he's everlasting, but he's also what? He's also Father. He's everlasting Father. And if you just think about those two words, each in context, everlasting speaks to the fact that he was fully God. Father speaks to the fact that he was fully man all at once. And I don't fully understand that, and neither do you, right? But I believe it by faith. Let's hone in on that word Father. Now, honing in on the word Father, man, it's difficult, is it not? Because for so many of us, the word Father, let's use the word Dad, man, it comes with all kinds of memories. Now, maybe for you, it's mostly good memories. And you look back and you think of dad and you're like, man, my dad was awesome. Hey, know that you are so blessed because that's not everybody's story. For others of you, the word dad comes with a lot of hurt, a lot of difficulty. And what we tend to do very naturally, I don't think we do it on purpose, but very naturally is we tend to take our experiences with our earthly dad and filter our beliefs of our heavenly father, our everlasting father, through what we experienced with our earthly dad. And, and listen, that is a dangerous place to be in. That is a dangerous place to be in theologically. That is a dangerous place to be in uh, relationally with God because it doesn't do God justice. And so I want to help you today by talking about this as difficult as it might be. Let, let's think about our earthly dad for a second. Maybe you experienced an earthly dad who was never satisfied. And you longed to hear those words like, I love you, I'm proud of you, but for whatever reason, maybe he just didn't communicate well, like you just couldn't hear those words from dad. It was like a carrot on a stick the whole time you're growing up. And so what you found was yourself uh, working, performing to try and get his affirmation, right? To try and get his approval, right? His acceptance, but it was never there. And as a pastor, unfortunately, you meet people all the time who've struggled with this kind of thing. And since they've struggled with this with their earthly dad, man, they bring the same ideas into their relationship with their everlasting father. Example, I had a friend in college. She was the very first person in her family to attend college. And she had a dream to just win her dad's approval. She wanted to go to college. She wanted to be the first one. She wanted to get a 4.0, graduate with honors, all that. Well, she did it. I'll never forget graduation day. She had communicated some of this to me, this struggle and I was close enough, I didn't mean to do it, it was just close enough to hear what her dad said to her. And he walked up and I could see it, like, I knew, she was just so excited, poised and ready for dad to say, you did such a great job, I'm so proud of you. But instead, he walked up and her dad said, well, it's getting late, we need to get home. Not even my dad, and man, it deflated me. Like, it, it ripped my soul to pieces to hear that. Some of you have experienced something similar to that with your earthly dad, Right? He just couldn't communicate his love, or, or you just never heard it. Some people even go to the point of all-out rebellion, thinking that maybe that will get dad's attention. I'm telling you, if we're not careful, what we do is we take that hurt from earthly dad, we bring it into our relationship with Jesus, and consequently, we, we believe he's never satisfied with me, right? That he's like, I call it baseball bat God, that he's just following you around with a baseball bat, waiting for you to get it wrong and go, oh, right? Oh, no, you messed up again. Here's another swat. Here's another smack, right? We, we become, if we're not careful, we become spiritual performers working to earn the satisfaction and the approval of our Heavenly Father. Problem is, that's not what the Bible says the gospel is all about. Maybe you experienced a dad who's always angry. Maybe he's never satisfied. Maybe he was always angry. And so when dad got home, boy, man, in your house, it was like, whoa, walk around on eggshells. Dad's home. He could get upset and start yelling. He could blow up about any th little thing at, at any second. Maybe it was worse than that. Maybe your dad said really hurtful words to you. You'll never amount to anything. I can't believe you're stupid, whatever. Maybe it's a, hey, in a room this big, there's at least a couple people who experience some kind of abuse from dad, verbal or even physical. And listen, if that's your experience, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I hope you can find healing in your heavenly father. Because listen, these things affect us very naturally. It will mess up our view of everlasting father. Here's the last one. Maybe you experienced a dad who was just never there. He's just not present. Now, again, maybe he was actually present, like physically, but just not emotionally present. Just not supportive, right? Just not spiritually present. Maybe he literally was not there. I asked my wife if I could share this. She, she's actually never met her real dad. 
he doesn't even know she exists. And that affects you. Maybe for you, it was divorce. It ripped your family apart, and, and dad was there, and then suddenly one day, everything completely changed. Dad is practically ripped out of your life. Maybe he missed your first soccer goal, you know? Ladies, maybe he wasn't there to sit on the side of the bed the first time your jerk boyfriend dumped you and like just told you and tell you you're beautiful and he loves you, right? Whatever it was. The point is we've all experienced pain when it comes to dad. Which, by the way, before I can go any further, I think I've got to point out, men, man, we have a responsibility in this world. God has designed us with a unique place in our families, in our communities, right? As dads, as husbands, as men in this world. And I didn't come to beat men down, but I came to call men to stand up and be who God has called us to be. We're here to make a difference. Yeah, there ought to be people going nuts and clap, the ladies at least. God's called us to a unique and important role in this world. I'm not saying the ladies don't have one. Theirs is crazy important too. But men, where are the men? I want to know where the men are. Sometimes it feels like we live in a world where men aren't men anymore, at least not the way God designed us to be. We are the spiritual leaders in our family. I read a statistic this week that proves it. I read this week that if a kid in the family gets saved, about 8% of the time, the rest of the family will give their life to Jesus. That's it. If the mom gives her life to Jesus, it goes up to about 30% of the time, the family will all start going to church and, and meet Jesus. But listen to this. If the husband gives his life to Jesus, it's 90% of the time that the family gives their life to Jesus. Why? Because we have an important role. And and listen, men, if you're kind of quiet because it makes you nervous, bro, I am with you. Man, this is one of the most important to know, you know, things in the world. One of the things we got to step up to the plate, but I'm going to admit it. It is also one of the most nerve-wracking, scary things to know. But that ain't going to stop me, and it shouldn't stop you. See, I'll be brutally honest with you. Um, If I had to pick one of the three things we just talked about for earthly fathers that I struggle with, and by the way, I only gave you three. We could do hundreds. Mine would have to be, if I had to pick out of the three, mine would be the anger thing. Because sometimes I'm just tired. I'm frustrated. I got so much going on, and I can just freak out. Anyone else with me? You know how how I'm feeling, men? You can just get upset about some dumb little thing, and it scares me to death to uh, to think that my kids could look at Jesus, their everlasting father, and go, oh, He must be mad at me all the time because that's how dad was. At least that's how it felt, right? Man, let's step up to the plate. Let's be who God has called us to be. We're the spiritual leaders of our homes, and we're here to help you do that. So I don't know what your life has been like with dad. I don't know what your journey is, but I want us to try something together, and I'm going to tell you it's hard. This is a hard thing to do, but let's try it. Let's try to take, no matter what the experience was with earthly dad, and just set it aside for a second, and let's try to look at our everlasting Father purely through the lens of Scripture. Can we do that? Come on, if we can do it, say, let's go. All right, three thoughts. First, our everlasting Father is compassionate. Our everlasting Father is compassionate. He's compassionate. He's not, like, fed up with us all the time. He's actually compassionate. Because of Jesus, he's actually satisfied. Psalm 103, the Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. I I love that first sentence. Like It addresses all three of the things we talked about, right? He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we actually deserve. Thank God that we don't get what we deserve because of Jesus. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Did you hear that? He's compassionate. He's tender, right? He's patient with us. And listen, I will never forget the day I gave my life to Jesus. I was born again, the Bible says. When you give your life to Christ, you are born again, a spiritual rebirth. But listen, I'll also never forget the day I was born again again. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about. I was born again as a, a teenager in high school. I was born again again about 10 years later 
When God brought me to this place where I finally realized, and I've seen others experience this, and it's so powerful, I finally realized that there is absolutely nothing, zip, zilch, nada that I can do to earn my way to heaven, to earn God's love for me, not a single thing that I can do. It was so spiritually liberating to understand finally that without Jesus, I'm totally hosed, and so are you. Even on your very, very best day, the Bible says, it's like filthy rags. That we all fall short of God's glorious standard. That was life-changing for me. And, and so maybe you're sitting here and you think you have to perform for God because you had to perform for dad to try and satisfy him. And maybe you've been living this life. Oh, I go to church or God won't be happy with me. If I don't read my Bible, God's not going to love me anymore. Like if I get it right for a little while, then God's happy. But then I get it wrong one day. Oh man, I'm not perfect. I forgot, right? And so for you spiritually, you're just like always stressed out, wondering whether or not God loves you. Does God approve of you? Listen to Jesus in Matthew 11. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you what? I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find, he says it again, you'll find what? Rest. You'll find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Some of you need to hear this more than anything today and, and anything this Christmas season. Rest. Just rest. Stop trying to do and do and stop trying to do this and do that to earn God's favor or approval. Stop thinking that you have to do that, and, and if you don't do that, God won't do that. And No, your, your theology, if that's you, it's all do-do. It's do-do. That's what it is, guys. It's do-do. It's all based on what you do or don't do. And the Bible says, no, Jesus came, and the work is now done. It is finished, Jesus said. You don't have to earn anything. The truth is you can't do anything to get to heaven anyway. You can't do anything to budge God's love for you one single bit to the left or the right. He just absolutely loves you, absolutely approves you, accepts you. Why? Because of your relationship with Jesus. That's what makes the difference. Jesus did all the work. He finished it and he gave it to us as a gift. This is perfect love, right? from our everlasting Father who is compassionate. Let's just respond in faith to Him. Do we still need to do those things? Absolutely, but they ought to be out of a response, out of the, just the overwhelming presence of the good news in our lives and what God's done for us, right? It's out of the overflow of that. It's not a, oh, oh here, i got to go to church or God's going to hate me. No, it's a, I get to go to church. I get to be a part of God's family because of Jesus. I'm telling you, for some of you, This is what needs to change in your life. You need to be born again again. How about this one? Our everlasting Father is caring and loving. I'm going to sneak in two on this one, okay? He's caring and he's loving. He's not angry at you. Our God will never abuse you. He's not waiting for an opportunity to take your job away or destroy something in your life. So many people have this idea about God. I don't see it in the Bible. I see a God who did whatever it took to radically rescue us. And I've learned, being a pastor almost 20 years now, um, if you can get someone to a point where they truly understand and know that God loves them, he's for them, not against them, he's all about them, right, and they really know it, man, that person's halfway home. Like, that's the hardest part. It's just getting people to actually believe this because it's so different, radically different than what we would do, right? It's so completely different than how we accept each other and approve of each other. The Bible says that the gospel is offensive to man. That is so radically different and amazing that sometimes, man, we're just offended by it. Like we can't even hear how good the good news is because it just doesn't make sense to us. 1 Peter 5 says, give all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you. And 1 John 4 gives us all the proof that we need. It says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. This is real love. Not that we loved God. It's got nothing to do with you earning. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. All the proof we need is Emmanuel, right? 
All the proof we need is hidden in the Christmas story. God in a bod, right? Jesus in that baby manger, man. That's all that we need. And then here's the last thought. Our everlasting Father, He's always present. He is always present. Your earthly father might not have been there, but your everlasting heavenly father, he is always, always there. Even if you never read your Bible again, he's there. You never go to church again, he's there. Your life completely goes into a tailspin and falls to pieces, he's there, right? You do a a really dumb thing and mess up your marriage, your God is still there. It doesn't feel like he's there, pastor. Listen, when it feels like God is not there, I challenge you to ask yourself this question. Who moved? Did I move or did God move? And I think what you'll find is we're the ones that turn our backs, give God the Heisman, and run the other direction. And that he is our loving, ever-present, everlasting Father, always there for us. 2 Peter 3 says, The Lord isn't being slow about his promises. Some people think, no, he's being patient. He's always there for your sake. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to repent. And yes, the day of the Lord is coming. Jesus is coming back, man. No no bones about that. Like, we understand that. There is a day of judgment, but none of that negates that God loves us, that he loves us. The proof is that he sent Jesus, right? He loves us. He's always for us, not against us. He's here to help us, right? Be strong and courageous. He's here for us. Look at Deuteronomy 31. Be strong and courageous, Do not fear them or be in dread of them. It is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. This is also quoted in Hebrews 13. It's quoted all through the book of Joshua. It's quoted all over the Bible. God is always with you, ever present, everlasting Father, never leaves you, never forsakes you, compassionate, caring, loving. That's our God. One more little story and I'll be done. Um, I think every parent in the room will, will kind of understand this and nod their head at it because you've had a similar experience. So I remember we lived on a cul-de-sac and my son was, I don't think he was even two years old yet. And we bought him his first bicycle. I'm like, oh yeah, here we go. Right. And uh, we get him a bicycle with, with training wheels on it. Well, the kid just hops on. Like he can barely talk, but he can totally ride a bike all the way down the street. Right. I'm not kidding. A couple days later, he's like, got a Phillips screwdriver. He's taking off the training wheels. I'm like, oh, this is going to be cool. Let's see what happens. And he gets out there. The kid can just ride the bike. I didn't even have to teach him. He can just do it. Miracle child, right? So then he, get, he starts getting gutsy. And, and it's just a few weeks later, they're, they're building a house across the street from ours at the time. He, I watch him go over to like the scrap pile and get a piece of plywood, two years old, drag it down to the curb. And I'm like, oh my God, he's creating a ramp. This is so cool. I, I made evil Knievel. I can't wait. And our driveway sloped. So he basically had calculated, I guess he was good at math too. Like, here's a slope, straight street, ramp. What he failed to see was a pile of concrete and, you know, wood and nails and all that over there. So, so I'm just kind of watching him, you know, I'm like, oh, this is going to be awesome. Let's see what happens. And man, a kid rides down the driveway, he ramps his bike and he just crashes. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Just right? I can see blood. And he does the thing where he didn't know I'm watching. So he gets up and parents, y'all know how they get up and they're totally fine. But then they turn and see you and they lose it. He turned and he's like, ah! right. And he's just, he's just losing it. And there's blood coming from his knees and his elbows and he's snot and crying. And he just, ah, daddy, daddy, daddy comes running and he gets close. And I just go like this and he just jumps into my arms and I squeeze him. I'm getting blood and snot all over me. Right. And, and he's going, to, <laughs> I'm like, what happened, buddy? And he's doing that. Y'all know when they can't even talk. I'm like, slow down. I don't speak Russian. And, and he goes, daddy, I'm hurt. I'm bleeding. You know? And I'm like, buddy, it's okay. Daddy's here. And I just pulled him real close. And I whispered a little prayer in his ear and he kind of settled down. Now, every parent's had an experience kind of like that. And what I wanted to tell you today is that as a Christian, you can have an experience like that every single day. Only you're not the father, you're the little kid with the bloody elbows and the bloody knees, right? Running to your dad, daddy, 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 and your heavenly father, man, he will scoop you up and he will pull you close and he will calm you down and he'll tell you, it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay. I'm here for you. He's our everlasting father. And that's some of the best news I've ever heard. Even though the name's got some mystery about it, I love how he's radically changed my life and what he's doing in this church and in your life. He's wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? 
And if you're a Christ follower, I want to ask you a question, and I hope it gets all up in your face and challenges you, and I hope it convicts you, and I hope it helps you. My question for you is this. If you believe in Jesus, in what ways have you maybe projected the image of your earthly dad onto your everlasting father? And kind of a second thought, how has that hindered your growth as a Christ follower? What does it need to change about that for you? And listen, if if you're willing to just say, I just want to know God better than ever, better than yesterday. I want to know God more clearly, more nearly, more dearly than ever. Would you put your hand up? Yes, God, I just want to know you better, better than yesterday. God, I know you, but I want to know you better. So many hands, you can put them down. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can know you better because of Jesus. Thank you that we can draw more near and near, just nearer and nearer to you every single day because of what Jesus did for us. Thank you that Jesus made a way where there could never be a way. Thank you that Jesus made all things right between us and you. And now we just have you, everlasting Father, wonderful counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace. God, we lean into you today. Move in our lives and listen as you continue to pray. Maybe today you don't know where you stand with God. And you've been on a journey. You've been maybe searching a little bit when it comes to the church thing and the Jesus thing and the Bible thing and the Christian thing. And and you just don't know where you stand. Listen, you may not know where you stand, but we know clearly from Scripture where God stands in relationship to you. He stands as a compassionate God, a loving God, a caring God, a God that is ever present. He stands with his arms wide open, waiting for you to come back home where you were always meant to be. And he loves you so much, he sent his only son to die for you. Salvation is a free gift that's actually already yours. But just like a Christmas gift, if you don't unwrap it and bring it into your life, like how crazy would it be for you to leave a gift under the tree in the wrapping paper? Nobody does that, but people do it with salvation. It's a free gift. It's already yours. It's been given to you. You got to take it, accept it, unwrap it. You got to use it. You got to allow God to, to do stuff through the gospel in your life. And if you're ready to take that faith step to just unwrap that free gift, we want to pray a prayer with you. It's just a simple prayer to indicate what God's doing in your heart and your soul right now. He sees that. And let's all pray together so no one stands alone. Let's pray like this Heavenly Father, I give you my life. Thank you for Jesus. He's everlasting. He's king, he's Lord, he's loving, he's caring, he's compassionate. Thank you for the cross. I repent from my sin and I turn to you. God, make me a brand new person. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's make some noise for what God's doing today.